This is Malik Hook from the University of Colorado. While I was a resident, Allergan put out a series of educational materials that I found to be invaluable for foundational knowledge on the topic of glaucoma. Specifically, the Forge One program was designed by a panel of experts and then spread across the nation and the world using a series of in-person and broadcast lectures. I will cover Forge Two, which focused on visual field testing at a later date. But I thought this was a good time to discuss the basics of optic nerve head evaluation since we have new incoming residents who are likely eager to learn the nuances of examining the optic nerve. The key consultants who contributed to the FORGE program included Jack Chaffee, Ann Coleman, Chris Gerken, Ron Gross, Jeff Liebman, and Bob Weinreb. Glaucoma is an optic neuropathy that has very characteristic visual field and optic nerve changes. There are multiple risk factors. You can see progressive injury to the retinal ganglion cells and their axons. There is a very specific pattern of optic atrophy, which we refer to as cupping, and there are associated visual functional deficits. Glaucoma prevalence is increasing as the population ages, and it affects more than 4 million individuals over the age of 40 in the United States. Glaucoma assessment. Assessment and documentation of the optic nerve and visual field are an essential component to the diagnosis, staging, and longitudinal assessment of glaucoma. Studies have shown that glaucoma patients have trouble with daily activities that involve light and dark adaptation. Independent of visual acuity changes, the loss of visual field was associated with a higher risk of falls, as well as with other negative effects on patients' lives, such as decreased enjoyment of reading and watching television. As I said before, the FORGE-1 program focuses specifically on optic nerve head assessment, and that is what we're going to cover over the next few slides. Five rules, or the five R's, for assessment of the optic disc. Number one, observe the scleral ring to identify the limits of the optic disc and its size. Most commonly and most effectively, measurement of the scleral ring is done in clinical practice at the slit lamp with the use of a handheld lens and slit lamp by a microscopy. Using the 78 diopter lens must be multiplied by a 1.1 to yield an absolute measure of the vertical disc diameter. For those who use a 90 diopter lens, multiply the number by 1.3. For those who use a 60 diopter lens, this is a direct measurement and there is no correction factor. Average vertical diameter is 1.8 millimeters. Average horizontal diameter is 1.9 millimeters. The size of the cup varies with the size of the disc. Large discs have large cups in healthy eyes. Here we have three different size healthy optic discs. On the left, we are looking at a small diameter optic disc, 1.4 millimeters. On the right, we are looking at a large diameter or macro disc with a vertical disc diameter of 2.4 millimeters. In general, smaller micro discs have an average vertical diameter of less than 1.5 millimeters. And the larger macro disc has a vertical diameter of greater than 2.2 millimeters. Large discs have large cups in healthy eyes. The second rule is to identify the size of the neuroretinal rim. Measurement of the retinal rim is made using the isn't rule, which is ascertained by looking at the rim width, the distance between the border of the disc, and the position of the blood vessels bending. The isn't rule suggests that in healthy eyes, inferior rim is always wider than the superior rim, which is wider than the nasal rim, which is wider than the temporal rim. In clinical practice, it is largely reliable, but it is not perfect. Jeff Liebman and his colleagues published an article in the Archives of Ophthalmology where they studied healthy and glaucomatous eyes and showed that in about two-thirds of the cases, normal eyes obey the isn't rule, and that the isn't rule is very often not obeyed in eyes with glaucoma. The third rule is to examine the retinal nerve fiber layer, which is always challenging. Again, in clinical practice, you can get a good estimate of the quality of the retinal nerve fiber layer at the slit lamp using the handheld lens. Typically, when examining the retinal nerve fiber layer, clinicians should look for a characteristic reflection pattern in the superior temporal region where the nerve fiber layer is thickest, and the infratemporal where it is also thickest, and bright reflections reflecting the thick retinal nerve fiber layer. In contrast to the papillomacular region, where the retinal nerve fiber layer is rather thin, the reflections are poor and it is dark. When looking at the optic disc, focus on the peripapillary retina to estimate the quality of the retinal nerve fiber layer and look for this bright, dark, bright pattern of reflections 
as you move from supratemporal to papillomacula to infratemporal regions. In eyes with diffuse retinal nerve fiber loss, the margins of the blood vessels are very sharp because they are embedded within the nerve fiber layer. The loss of the striation pattern will also be evident. This accounts for about 50% of the patients who develop glaucoma with ocular hypertension. The other patients typically have a focal or local pattern of retinal nerve fiber loss. Most commonly, this will occur in the infratemporal region, followed in terms of frequency by the supratemporal region. This is detectable at the slit lamp using a handheld lens in color, but a red free or green light sometimes provides a better view. Stereo disc photographs should be a part of the baseline examination for all patients. When the patient returns for follow-up, one area to pay particular attention to is the retinal nerve fiber layer, which should be compared with the baseline photographs. Few studies have compared the sensitivity of optic disc and RNFL assessment. From annual examinations of 813 ocular hypertensive eyes, optic disc and nerve fiber layer photographs were compared in two age match subgroups. 37 eyes that converted to abnormal visual field tests at the end of a five-year period and 37 control eyes that retained normal field tests. This change was detected in only 7 of 37 or 19 percent converters to field loss and in 1 of 37 or 3 percent controls. Progressive nerve fiber layer loss was observed in 18 of 37 or 49 percent converters and in 3 of 37 or 8 percent controls. In this important study, serial nerve fiber layer examination was more sensitive than color disc photograph evaluation in the detection of progressive glaucoma damage at this early stage of glaucoma. This is one thing that new residents can look for in clinic. This wedge shape that you see here between the two arrows in either red free or color photography. Also, of course, at the slit lamp with your choice of handheld lens. The fourth rule is examine the region of peripapillary atrophy, the region adjacent to the optic disc. There are two types of peripapillary atrophy, alpha zone and beta zone. Alpha zone is typically more peripheral and it consists of hypo and hyperpigmented areas. When you think of alpha, think of away. Alpha is away from the optic nerve. It is present in normal as well as glaucomatous eyes. The beta zone is characteristically adjacent to the optic disc. When you think beta, think beside. Beta is beside the nerve. It consists of atrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium and chorea capillaris. Generally, the large choroidal vessels are visible, especially in glaucomatous eyes. The width of the beta zone inversely correlates with the rim width at that same area. As patients' neuroretinal rims thin, typically the beta zone or peripapillary atrophy increases in size. The final rule is to look for retinal and optic disc hemorrhages. These can be very challenging at times even for experts, sometimes being very prominent and sometimes very subtle. When examining baseline stereo photographs at follow-up exams, one of the areas to focus on is whether or not an optic disc hemorrhage is present that might have been missed during the clinical examination. Let's recap the five rules. Rule number one is disc size. This patient has a small disc. Rule number two, the isn't rule. The isn't rule is not obeyed. The inferior rim is more narrow than the superior rim. This should be a red flag suggesting that the patient may have glaucoma. Rule number three, RNFL defects. Looking carefully at the retinal nerve fiber layer, there is a wedge-shaped retinal nerve fiber layer defect. Rule number four, peripapillary atrophy. There is no significant peripapillary atrophy in this patient. Rule number five, hemorrhages. There is a minute peripapillary optic disc hemorrhage. So the question is, does this patient have glaucoma? And the answer is yes, this patient has glaucoma when following the five rules. I hope these five rules are steps that you can remember while you're examining your first patients in clinic. And I think these lessons are still valuable after residency and well into the career of seasoned ophthalmologists. If you're looking for more educational resources, consider visiting keogt.com. You can also visit my YouTube channel for various lectures, including this one. And you can also visit Instagram and Twitter for other educational materials. Thank you for your time.